Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, this morning's Wednesday seminar. Um, my name is Donna Cathro. I am the director for Onshore Seismic and Magnetotellurics within the Mineral Systems Branch. And I have the pleasure of introducing the speakers for today's seminar. Before we get started, Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay, pay our respects to the people, the cultures, the elders past and present. So this morning's speakers, uh, Dr. Babak Hajrani and Dr. Alexei Gorbatov, and their presentation as shown here is on uh, passive seismic lithospheric imaging implications for mineral potential assessment. Uh, it, it has only been recently that the application of passive seismic imaging techniques has gained significant traction in industry and through national programs, despite its long standing use in academia. During this talk, Babak and Alexi will highlight several innovative techniques. Um, the team has developed and successfully implemented in a scalable and efficient manner. These techniques have proven instrumental in identifying fundamental structures within the Earth's subsurface, providing valuable insights previously untapped by conventional methods. This morning, they will delve into the transformative potential of passive seismic imaging and its emerging role in advancing our understanding of the Earth's 3D structure. A little bit about the speakers. Dr. Hadrani is a seismologist specialising in the field of geophysics within Geoscience Australia's onshore seismic and magnetotelluric section. He has a decade, he had a decade long background as a research in academia and then Babak joined Geoscience Australia in 2018 and has since made contributions to developing new technologies for passive seismic imaging. He has established fruitful collaborations within international, with international organisations in Europe and Australia with a primary focus around developing and implementing advanced imaging technologies that provide enhanced insights into the lithospheric structure of Australia. Babak strives to push the boundaries of seismic imaging, enabling more accurate interpretations of subsurface features. So Babak will be followed by Dr. Alexei Gorbatov, and he is the passive seismic activity leader within the onshore seismic and magnetotelluric section who fostered application of passive seismic techniques in mineral potential studies. His scientific interests also include theory of seismic imaging, inversion methods, seismotectonics, and seismic source generation processes. With over 15, over 15 years of experience prior to joining Geoscience Australia in 2004, Alexei currently leads the Exploring for the Future Osiray uh, project, which aims to create a national three-dimensional lithospheric model. Integration of this model with other geophysical and geological data will bring new insights into the structure and composition of the Australian lithosphere. It will be used not only for mineral potential assessment, but also for forecasting the economic viability for resource development. Um, I would like to welcome Babak as the first speaker to the podium. Thank you. Thanks everyone, thanks for coming and thanks to those who are listening to us online. Um, the top topic of the talk today is passive seismic lithospheric imaging, as Donna said, and we want to see its implication for mineral potential assessment. Uh, Donna did the acknowledgement of the country. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country. And um, so minerals, um, they do shape our world. Everything we own and everything that makes our modern life depends on minerals, the phones, the laptops, tablets, TVs, electric cars that you own. Min minerals are essential parts of, are essential ingredients of making those devices. And which are, with our future uh, transition into renewable energies, such as having uh, wind turbines, solar panels, batteries, in this transition, uh, minerals are essential to make this happen. Um, this is a nice image that I uh, copy paste it uh, over here. It just nicely shows you what goes, what minerals are required uh, for a battery in your electric car. So the diversity of these minerals underpins the quality of our life, obviously. So the image, the uh, question we are having is that where are they 
forming? Where are the deposits, um, mineral deposits forming? And where should we be looking for them? Um, recent studies, um, I would like to mention two. Um, I've shown that structure controls the mineralization. Here's an example of uh, Hogarth at Home in 2020, where they show they uh, plotted a the mineral deposits, large mineral deposits globally on top of lithosphere stenospheric boundary. In this image, I'm not sure, yeah, you can see my mouse cursor. Um, so the lithosphere stenospheric boundary is shown with this color bar. Um, so the red one means that the lithosphere is thin. The blue one means the blue colors means the lithosphere is thick. And if you notice, the majority of the uh, mineral deposits, large deposits around the world, are located near the edges of this boundary, of the, uh, where the lithosphere is about 170 kilometers, which this color bar is actually centered around. And um, there is another study which I have contributed to. It's a, it's a cross section through Mariana Trench. And Isoponin trench, um, Isoponin uh, through the cross um, subduction zone here. This is what the Pacific plate subducts beneath the, the other plate over here in Mariana, and this is the Isoponin. And we under, we realize that there are a large number of earthquakes that occur uh, from, that they initiate from the base, from the top of the uh, subducting plate, that they come up uh, towards the surface. And we interpreted these as uh, uh, fluid and uh, melted material that are being brought up to the surface. So clearly, the structure has a control over what dives beneath over here, the subducting plate, and what comes up. Okay, so um, it, these are just two examples, conceptual examples of how the structure can control what gets deposited at the surface. Now, so the key question now is, uh, so the the, the take-home message is that the structure controls the, the, the deposits, but the question for us and the passive seismic team is how to image, uh, how to provide a 3D uh, image of their structure, which because that's going to control the deposits. Um, a little bit about the passive seismic method. Um, so right now, beneath our ground, uh, beneath our feet, the ground is vibrating. We don't feel it, but if there is a relatively large earthquake nearby, you do feel that. Uh, but then uh, we use seismometers to record um, uh, background noise, uh, which could be the interaction between the ocean waves and the solid earth, or it could be earthquakes, or it could be anthropogenic noise made by humans. So what would a seismic signal look like? Um, he, he, this is an example of a magnitude, I believe, 7.5 um, in Papua New Guinea, which was recorded by one of our stations. I just plotted them here. The uh, first arrival, primary arrival, P wave co comes in. I've shown it with red over here. The second arrival, S wave comes in second, as the name suggests, followed by a large trail of surf what we call surface waves. This is how the, these waves travel through the Earth. This is an a simulation for P wave and S wave. So the P wave and S wave, they're called body wave. The, the term comes from the fact that they actually penetrate through the through Earth and then they come up after that. But surface wave, they actually travel, as the name suggests, along the surface. This is how uh, a surface wave travels along the surface. Um, uh, an important thing, which is it, um, the reason I've chosen this one, is because it actually explains everything about surface wave that we need to know. Um, as you can see, at, this, at near the surface, they have really high amplitude, but that amplitude decays as you go deeper and deeper, and that's nicely shown by this sensitivity, by this sensitivity kernel for surface waves. So at shorter periods up here, they the sensitivity, of, for example, at eight second, we have where the surface waves are sensitive at, uh, to depth about eight to ten kilometer, as it's shown. Sorry, should be over. As it's shown by in this graph, but as we go to longer periods, the um, uh, surface waves become sensitive to deeper depth, and their sensitivity decreases. Okay, so they become an average sensitivity over the whole crust. So now. The technique that I'm going, I'm going to be talking about today is ambient noise tomography. The ambient noise, obviously, where the, what the names comes from, the noise in the background, 
Um, you might think that this is there's no use for this. That's called noise, as the name suggests. But there is actually valuable information in the background noise, and I'll show I'll show you how uh, we can convert we can extract surface wave information from the um, uh, background noise. But a little bit about tomography. What do we do in tomography? If somebody gives you a box and says, "What's the velocity of that box?" OK, what's the velocity of the material in this box? Well, a simple way to do that is to put up a source and a receiver on two sides of the box, shoot from one side to the other, measure the time, and distance is equal velocity times time, right? And But if there are more than one box, and it's a bit more complicated, you can't do that. You can't um, measure the velocity of two boxes with just one shooting. You need more data. With more data, you get more equations so you can solve the velocity of each box. And then we show these velocities with a color. OK, we color them like in, if the top one is fast and below, the one below is slow in a color bar like this, it will show up like this. OK, so now a more generalized version. If you have a box which you know nothing about, you parameterize this box by parameterization, which means in, we mean we divide it into cells that we try to estimate their velocities. Um, we deploy seismic uh, sources and receivers around this area, uh, around, around the box, and then we shoot from each source to each receiver. Okay, and then we measure the travel time that it takes from each source to each receiver. That's our data t travel times, and then we, we also we can also compute the length of the set the segment, the length of each segment of this ray inside each box, and that's over here. So we can we can easily um, summarize this into an equation where g g times m equal d d is your data m is the slowness or velocity of each box and g is the is the kernel of your it's a kernel of your inversion which is just simply the segment of each ray inside each cell and we can resolve this sorry we can uh, we can resolve this using a least square inversion now. Um, we usually apply a damping and smoothing to stabilize this inversion. Uh, damping and smoothing won't allow the velocity in each cell to deviate significantly compared to its surroundings. Um, this is done in everyday life. In fact, actually, um, uh, it was developed. Uh, um, it wasn't developed in geophysics first. The, uh, the main idea came from uh, medical sciences, where every time you take a CT scan of your brain, they don't cut your brain open. They actually put uh, sources and receivers around your head, and they do an image imaging like this, and you obtain an image like that. So this is an X-ray image of hand. I've shown them with two color bars. One is gray, or this one is actually called bone, the color bar bone, and um, this one over here, jet. I will be showing the the gravity image of the whole of Australia using this color bar. But that's the sort of thing that we do. We do a tomography, and then we image it, and then we color it. Uh, color these velocities uh, using a color bar. So over here you see a density variation of someone's hand. For uh, in this talk, I will talk about velocity variations within the Earth's crust. Um, ambient noise tomography has been around for nearly two decades now, more than two decades. Developed in early 2000s, um, there are workflows that have been well established. Uh, over several thousand citations. Here's an example below here for or done by Ekstrom 2014 for the US array. This is a surface wave velocity model, which shows you over here the US is slow, minus 48% slower than the rest of US. I leave the interpretation of that uh, for the people who live in US. Um, for, for now, I just want to show you examples of what uh, what uh, passive seismic imaging, in this case, ambient noise tomography, can do. So that was a continental scale image in the US. This is a very small scale study that I've done with our student, with Phil Cummins and our student, Rex Array, um, uh, where we have imaged the Jakarta Basin and its wider area. And I was quite pleased to see uh, the uh, how um, Ambient noise tomography nicely fits the borehole data and the, um, the active seismic uh, interpreted data. 
Um, there are other applications, even smaller scale applications. This is a very small scale application, like 100 by 100 kilometer simulation done for a volcano in Philippines, I believe, where they nicely imaged um, a magma chamber beneath the volcano. So it's across the scale, from continental scale images to tiny little things uh, that you want to see in the shallow or deeper crust can be imaged by ambient noise tomography. OK, so how it's done. Um, before uh, talking about ambient noise tomography itself, I'll talk about a few things, a um, few um, terminologies that I will be using through the talk. First one, cross correlation. Two functions, F and G, two sinusoidal oscillations, when they match, if you move one through the other, when they don't match, anti correlation, your, your cross correlation function has a value of minus one. But when they match, your cross correlation function has a value of one. So it's just a measure of similarities, as simple as that. Now, you can think of a scenario where you have two receivers, A and B, and there's a signal coming from, from this side, from the left, I believe, yeah, left on the screen, and uh, it gets recorded at A and B. The cross correlation of A and B here will just give you a signal at T minus, uh, T B minus A, which is the time between the two, which tells you that uh, the, the, with the similarity between these two waveforms just tells you the time shift between the two peaks over here. And you can do that with seismic data. If there is a signal similarity between two seismic signals and you cross correlate them, the function that you're getting just uh, shows you the time shift between the two. Now, um, that could be that that was a very simplistic case. A more generalized, more generalized case would be that this that uh, energy comes from both sides. So the cross correlation now will have a um, positive time lag and a negative time lag. So notice that on this axis here and also here, the time isn't uh, time over this over your signal. This is a, this is just simply time delay or what we refer to as time lag, and it could be negative and positive. So we end up with a signal on a uh, positive side and a, a negative side. The positive side is called the causal side, and the negative side is called the acausal side. Now, in the theory of ambient noise is more generalized. It assumes that um, that sources of energy are not coming only from left and right. It comes, it's coming, it's in 3D, so they're coming from all over the place. And your stations in the middle will record all of them. So when you cross correlate, what you have to do is you have to cross correlate, and you do that over and over, and stack all those data to remove the effect, to cancel out the effect from minus 90 degree to plus 90 degree, and only amplify the ones from 0 and 180, which gives you the surface wave signal. I'll explain that in the late in, in the next slide, but be, just be aware that in reality, uh, the, obviously nothing matches the theory, but uh, this is the theoretical uh, framework, but in reality we have something like this. This is a study by Prieto et al. in 2009, where they have actually measured where the energy comes in from in ambient noise, and you can see it, it's not exactly 360 degrees, but it is, it's something that we can work with, obviously. Now, um, a slight modification in this workflow is that we cut hourly windows instead of daily windows, and we don't normalize in time. I don't want, to, I don't go into, into detail of why we're doing that, but I just want to show you some results. So these are 60,000 hourly cross correlations between two stations, station Meek and EIDS, one in East and one in West of Australia. And um, when you look at this image, uh, there's no signal there. I've looked at it really hard. There's nothing there. Um, and it actually reminds me of TV static. Any one of you remember 90s? Uh, yes, after midnight. Yes, you know, Carol remembers that. <laughs> after midnight, after 12, that's what you see on your TV. Not anymore. Um, so, but remember that the theory of ambient noise is telling us that you should not expect to see a signal in each hourly cross correlation. In, you should not expect to see in, any signal in any of these. What you have to do is to stack so that you remove the effect. So you, the, the effect from these azimuths cancel out and the effects from these two in the blue lobes, they amplify. And I've tried to animate this. Hopefully the animation looks like. So what I'm showing you here is the first hour. It's at the bottom over here. And then uh, the animation will just add uh, cross correlations to this one. OK, and you would see, oops, sorry. I should I click on this. There we go. OK, so now you can see 
even up to 1000 hours there's no signal in there but if you cross 5000 hours you start you see you start to see the signal emerging and if, of course if you stack more you get a better signal and you you suppress the noise and you amplify the signal and by 60000 hours which is the sum of all of these uh, cross correlations over here you get a nice signal of ambient noise of surface waves okay so how do we use this to image the Earth's structure? Um, the, 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 the example that I showed you from between station MEEK and, e and EIDS is over here. And I've filtered this in different frequency bands. So at low frequency bands, these waves are traveling deep within the Earth. So they are sensitive to the convective mantle. Um, and they arrive early because the Earth's velocity structure, deep, as we go deeper, it gets higher. So these travel fast. And then as you go towards higher frequencies, they arrive, okay, sorry, they arrive later and later, okay? So, and this is what we call the dispersive properties of surface waves. It has, a uh, surface waves velocity depends on frequency. So if you are at low, at low frequencies, you arrive, uh, you're traveling fast. And if you are at higher frequencies, you're traveling slow. And this is exactly, and you would see this in the uh, sensitivity kernels that I showed earlier before, um, if you, the low frequencies are more sensitive to low frequencies or longer periods, in this case 30 seconds, are more sensitive to deeper depths, therefore they travel faster. Now, uh, this case, the, these two stations, this is just one example of many cross correlations that we can compute. So if I put them on a, on a vertical scale where the y-axis is now the interstation distance. So the distance between these two is 3,200 kilometers, roughly. So I put them over there, okay? You could see a tiny little signal over here, a causal and causal signal. But we can do this for all cross correlations across Australia. And then you would see how surface waves are arriving, okay? So if the stations are close, it takes smaller time, it takes less time for the surface waves to arrive. Therefore, these two causal and a-causal signals are very close. But as you as the distance between the stations increases, um, you see the surface wave arrive later and later. Okay, so this is the data that we'll be working with. And this is what you see in most publications. But one thing that most publications don't show you is actually this image. Um, so the I here I've plotted only the high quality ones on the right. On the left, these are the low quality ones. Okay. So we usually throw these out. Um, now we have uh, uh, we did uh, during EFTF1 uh, project, we deployed seismometers here in Queensland and Northern Territory, mostly in Northern Territory, and that's what I would be talking about. Most of the talk about that will, will be about that deployment. But just to tell you that we have another deployment, uh, which is um, the, it's currently recording, and it's this it's a two by two degree array that covers the entire continent. And a little bit about the passive seismic method. Um, it's actually very cheap. One passive seismic station costs six thousand um, dollars. Compared to other uh, methods like active seismic, it's I think it's extremely cheap, and it provides a three D volumetric image of the crust and mantle. It has a minimum impact on the environment. We basically need a half half by half meter space to dig a hole as I don't know twenty five centimeters deep, and that's it. And uh, yeah, there will be a tiny little solar panel on top. Um, so, okay, now how do we make those measurements? How do we convert the surface waves that we have just calculated into information about the Earth's structure? The, I brought an example from Extron 2009. This is a seismic, this is from the US array. And uh, if you take an FFT, fast Fourier transform of your signal, it will look something like this in the time loop, in the frequency domain. That's uh, uh, the dark blue is the real part, is the real part of the signal, a real part of the FFT of your signal. Now, the first person, well, I think it was Aki in 1957, sorry, there should be a reference to Aki 1957. He was the first to discover that these oscillations, okay, they look like Bessel function oscillations. If you don't know what Bessel functions are, think of them as ju just something as a, an oscillating function something like cosine function where the amplitude actually just decays as you go further okay he was the first to realize this and he came up with a formula to use zeros of the bessel function and the zeros of the real part of the spectrum 
of our data to obtain surface wave dispersion curves. OK, so these are dispersion curves. They tell you uh, that the Earth's velocity at each frequency. And as you can see, as we go towards lower frequency, 0 0.02, the uh, velocity increases. And as we go towards higher velocity, uh, higher frequencies, shallower layers of the crust, um, the velocity decreases. OK, but there is a problem with this with this workflow, and that is that you get multiple dispersion curves. OK, depending on which zero of this special function you start with, which is shown by these three arrows, you end up with different dispersion curves. And we usually seismologists usually actually sit down and pick these dispersion curves. OK, this is a significant manual part of the work uh, that I will talk about that we have tried to automate this, and I think we have succeeded in that. But that's not the only problem with this workflow. It's not that, that you have to pick one of these is that um, the cases like this where Goran Ekstrom is showing in this paper and cases like this that I showed you today, they only make up up, up, up to 30 to 40 percent of the data. The rest of the data looks like this. It's quite noisy. There are bumps on the road. It's not it is no it's not a smooth curve that represents the Earth's signal. So you do need to pick these and that's what most seismologists do. So now let's not pick those and just select the one that is in the middle. I just want to show you what will happen if you don't uh, in, if you don't use the knowledge of an expert to pick those arrivals. You end up with a, a number of dispersion curves. These are 15,000 dispersion curves for the array that I showed you in a few slides back uh, in Northern Territory. And if you do a seismic tomography of that, it looks like this. OK, this is not a real Earth structure. OK, the Earth does not look like this <laughs> fast and slow, fast and slow. No, that's not re real. Um, but we have came up with an automated method. Uh, I've developed this for the past two years, and um, that's the dispersion curves that I'm getting from my automated method. I think just visually looking at these toggling between those two, um, you do realize that it's uh, is a significant improvement in the, the variation uh, of the data. OK, and if you do a tomography with this, you get an image like that. OK, so let's talk about this image for a second. Um, this is Mount Isa, this block, and this is Tennant Creek. These are two important exploration sites. Uh, we see uh, high velocity beneath Mount Isa, and we know there's outcrop there. And then right next to that, we see a low velocity, which is we, we also know that this is a Carrara Basin. This was discovered during EFTF1. And the rest of the model actually looks like what we might think is an Earth structure. OK, so using this automated method, um, we can actually uh, get dispersion curves like this, and we can do this inversion for um, every frequency band, basically. I've selected the ones that I've chosen for this study. So I've done, I have maps, 2D velocity maps like this at each frequency. And then I use those in a trans-dimensional Bayesian inversion to invert for a 1D structure, for, for invert for a 1D structure beneath every dot, which is a station over here. So I end up with a 3D model using this, okay? I can't go into details of what these models are and how these details go, but I just want to jump into uh, some comparison and show you some results and some data. OK, so we have the RC base database. I'm, I want to compare my um, ambient noise tomography model with what we currently have. And that's one of the advantages of working in, in Australia is that there is a wealth of uh, geoscience information that you can use. Uh, RC base in 2020, this is a 2021 uh, model. Uh, is based originally on frog tech geoscience RC based 2005. So they started in 2005 and now it's it's uh, taken on by gymnastics and they use basically um, gravity, magnetic, DEM, surface geology, whatever data is available near the surface to constrain uh, the depth of the basement. So the aim of this work is to constrain the depth of the sedimentary basement across Australia. And they calibrate their data using uh, with 2D seismic data with boreholes uh, in the area, rock properties, and so on. So it's a significant job. Uh, it's it's an amazing job that they have done, and it's a good uh, first uh, test to to have against any model that we produce. 
OK, so this is the model. I keep the uh, top of, I plotted this uh, with with a color bar, but it also I've shaded it so that you see it when I overlay the seismic velocities on top. So the shade remains. Shade is, is still represents the depth to the basement, but the color now represents my uh, ambient noise tomography at depth one kilometer. So clearly you could see that where they suggest that there is a basement, I do get low velocities, even in this tiny little one, in that one, and over there. And in, in this new discover, newly discovered basin, Carrara Basin, they, that they suggest it's, it goes as deep as, um, I think they suggest it goes as deep as 10 kilometer. We do get a low velocity there. So this is a very good um, first order comparison with another data set, okay? So, but now, let's compare this with gravity okay this is an image of the um, gravity field in northern territory and i think partly in queensland as well um, you see the color bar and i will show you a cross section a to b over this uh, data and you could see so there is a there is a gravity low and then high over here low high again and i also show you plot the sea base okay uh, across the same cross section through sea base, which shows you the depth of the sedimentary basins across the, this area. And now I will overlay the seismic tomography on top. Okay. Now this is this is really interesting. So the my seismic tomography is suggesting that the sediment the the basin could actually be deeper here over there. Um, but what's more interesting is that is this uh, upwelling feature from the base of the uh, crust. Okay. So the uh, seismic velo the velocities here are slow velocities are red, fast velocities are, are blue. And when you're in blue area, you're kind of into the mantle velocities, but you could see this upwelling uh, through, from the mantle coming up and it's continue over here, which is right beneath the uh, gravity, high gravity. These material are also here and uh, Alexei will talk about what these velocities are. So I want to summarize here about uh, what we have done. So um, take all messages, structure control has a control over mineral mineralization. Passive seismic provides um, 3D volumetric images of the crust, in this case ambient noise as I've shown you, is a minimum impact on environment. It's now scalable and streamlined because we have automated the method. And stay tuned for the continental image that we'll show that we will show by the end of EFTF2. And inspired by these results over here, Alexei will present models for the crust that match the gravity data and discuss how these models uh, and, and discuss these models in the context of mineralization. And I'll hand over to Alexei. Thank you. Thank you, Babak. Uh here I'll continue with a little bit different method. Uh, he presented a uh, method of a volumetric uh, assessment uh, of uh, seismic velocity fields. In my case, I would talk about the receiver function. The receiver function is a little bit different method that focus mostly on interfaces. Why interfaces? Um, because one of the most important interface on Earth is the motor. It's the interface between crust and mantle. Whatever uh, a uh, fertile zone exists under the moho. To bring all the goodies, all the minerals up, you need to cross the moho. And when it happens, moho start to distort because you need to tear it, you need to include um, temperatures, volcanic um, events, so that it will be reflected in the moho. And receiver functions are extremely good tool and was used for decades uh, to study moho shape and properties. What is the difference between uh, receiver functions and, for example, uh, reflection service that commonly used in uh, exploration? In exploration, you use the source, explosion or huge tracks on the top. They transmit the energy, it reflects from the moho, and we record on seismic stations. It's a quite uh, challenging as a huge uh, enterprise. In case of receiver functions, we use distant earthquakes. Uh, waves, they're traveling very deep, they're arriving from underneath uh, to the seismic uh, stations, and they convert at every uh, interface from one type of wave to another. So the receiver function is actually how to isolate these conversions and map them. At the first, the strongest pulse 
it's coming from the P as a first wave, primary one, and all the conversions from the Moho, for example, in this case, coming later. The, about the properties of the waves. Usually, receiver functions or converted waves. <clears throat> they have much wider sensitivity to gradual uh, interfaces. Meanwhile, reflections, they are definitely more detailed, but they can map very tiny, very sharp ones. If it's not sharp, they start to lose interface and struggle <clears throat> Sorry, to map um, deep structure or gradual structures. So a receiver function in this case is just an ideal tool uh, to do this kind of job. With a receiver function, you can definitely use it just for inversion, like a 1D inversion of the structure, or do uh, probably fancy, but the simplest thing is just project them to the depths, the depths as they are, and paint in red, and blue, red is a transition from high velocity to low velocity, down, downward, and blue when it's hitting something hard from underneath. If you have many, many rays coming to the stations, you can do for all these rays this kind of image, and you will see the moho. If you have many, many rays, it's become like a continuous uh, image and is called migration image or CCP stack image or CCP image. This example uh, uh, two inversions of receiver functions, 1D inversions, showing that even within tiny distance for tiny distance now scale like a 50 kilometers, Moho can be very sharp on the left or quite transitional on the right, just within 50 kilometers. If you compare to the reflection, with the red line of the reflection line we have there is a comparison between reflection on the left and receiver function on the right of this um, migrated image. As you can see, actually the shapes are quite identical. Certainly they wouldn't be exactly the same because different ways they map not exactly uh, the same um, level of uh, heterogeneity. But even on this uh, scale, they're quite comparable. Now about the Moho, it's already we're doing this job for many years. We're updating it, and it's one of the, our latest release with Academia, that is Australia Moho. If we compare from previous release, that like 10 years before, we see the difference about up to five kilometers, and specifically when we put more stations and more data. So actually, addition of every data set will bring precision to this map. And mostly these errors because of the interpolation where we don't have the data. And how it is important, why it is important. I will talk about this example with uh, uh, Tenant Green Mount Asa area, specifically um, Mount Isa in layer one of the probably most uh, digged and uh, studied area in uh, mineral industry. And this is an interpretation from Drummond and all N98 with the interpretation of the reflection refraction profile where we see uh, underplating at the bottom of the moho. We have like a seals or mid crust bodies um, in the middle and we have Gidea suture with a set of uh, faults in this area. Can we see in the receiver function? And I'll talk. Uh, about the receiver function here, this AA is a receiver function profile. The red one is a exactly a location of this um, reflection refraction profile from active survey. And uh, our array, passive array from EFTF1 on this map. So you see this continuous fat red line. Uh, and on the right, uh, the Mount Isa location, and uh, I'll show the Gide Sucha location. Now, do we see these seals? Yeah, we do see the seals, and not only in Mount Isa, in many places here. We can trace the Moho. How will it help us? Well, first, faults, faults, especially the spheric faults, they're very important because they are um, transition of the channels for fluids of bedding and transition and bringing minerals to the surface. So huge lithospheric uh, faults are important in mineralization. And we can see them in Moho because to break crust, you need to break all together. And even if you have basins on the top, we will don't see it on the top, we will see it in the Moho. And for this particular profile, we know the Mount Isa, we know the 
these are underplating a lot of good is actually on the top because Mount Ice is one of the most uh, prominent uh, mining site in Northern Territory with this um, copper, uh, iron oxide, uh, copper gold deposits and plastic deposits. And we can see kings in the uh, shape. Well, Moho, we have a Gideas Yucha faults, we have a Corp faults, but we have other kings that are not really associated yet uh, with the faulting. They're very prominent, they're under basement, and this information actually used by geologists to build this kind of map. So major crustal boundaries map of Australia that is done by uh, Michael Dublin and it's in progress. And this information from the series functions go to update this map right now. Now, I'm going to walk you through all these cross sections from south to north and talking about underplating. If you really uh, build a model, like a mantle crust and uh, basins, and compare with the gravity, and this one is a gravity modeling, they'll see that it doesn't match on the long wavelengths. Why? Because topography, opportunity of the moha, it's not enough to explain these long wavelengths. Would it work with underplating? Yes, it does. If you have this underplating, actually, it fits quite nice. We'll go up. Does it work always? Meh, partially. Actually, in this case, we need to introduce kind of low velocity bo uh, body to bring it down, or high velocity body to bring it up. In uh, research functions, we don't see what it calls. It's probably this area is an area that we can narrow for active survey, actually, and really look at the details what happening there. Maybe something good for us. And we can dig it out. Oh. Going up. Perfectly fit even without um, too much uh, strange bodies there. Up again. And the last one it's again. So actually, the simple models with underplating really can explain a lot of gravity with the basins on the top uh, and help us to narrow areas where we really need to look for these more expensive methods. If you put Selected cross sections is just because of our cluttering. Uh, I put only three on the map. We can see this is a progression of uh, underplating from south to north, where the middle is probably <clears throat> more prominent. And at the bottom is large igneous provinces like a Kalkaringi uh, province that is overlapping with Mount Isa in a magmatic uh, signature at the top. Uh, large igneous provinces are very important for mineralization. Even they are the, by themselves, uh, they don't bring minerals. It's a big uh, reorganization, chemical reorganization. It's a bringing fluids up, it's a uh, this, uh, faulting. So it's a good mechanism that uh, should be studied and really uh, understood if you talk about the mineral systems. So looking uh, uh, more closely, on the top is a gravity anomalies where the reddish it's a high gravity anomalies, the bluish is a low gravity anomalies, and at the bottom is the depth of the moho. In most cases, as you saw, depth of the moho quite correlates with underplating in this area. And we can see that we have Kalkaringi uh, basin on the more um, northwest and Mount Isa, and they're really separated. So we knew from dating that they separate and, uh, and Kalkaringi probably doesn't have uh, the same kind of mineralization as Mount Isa. Nevertheless, we can start to understand what's happening there and we can narrow these areas for other studies for dating and optimize our efforts to understand mineral system in the area. And even by orientation, we can understand that they're really not too much related uh, in the nature. When we talk about the Karkaringi, uh, there was a signature of sediments in the volcanics. And the story behind it is that there was a subduction, the sediments of water was brought under the lithosphere, on the moho. There was a, a long um, time of fertilization and decompression melting and going up. So interesting things here is um, how people interpret um, igneous provinces, and they look like uh, mushrooms where we have accumulation at the bottom 
and the mushrooms type of our plumes going somewhere in the middle of the crust. And actually, it is important to feature that we can explain why we have these seals in the mid crust. It's difficult to explain how the reader originated there. And we look to the um, strength envelopes of different uh, setups. We can see that to really have a two barriers that can really trap uh, think or magmatic events in the mid crust and the bottom of the moho, we need to have water in a lower crust and we need to have a lower and upper mantle. So it's another good indication for the area where we have a fertile uh, uh, fertile areas uh, for mineralization and it could be derived from receiver functions. So here's a conclusion on this talk. So we talked about the actual immunization is by uh, controlled by uh, structure and passive seismic is quite good tool to map structure. Passive seismic has many, many different tools. It's not only ambient noise tomography or receiver functions. We do many things and we will have opportunity to talk about it later. But what the message is, it's very uh, universal, very scalable, uh, not invasive tool that can be used to narrow areas for more uh, focused studies. It is very important uh, component on any modeling, starting from mapping uh, sedimentary cover, cross and mantle structure, major folds. It's very important component and gravimetric modeling. Even if you just build the gravimetric map, people use shape of the moho to account for this. And definitely all this information is used in more uh, detailed thermomechanical modeling for uh, metasomatism of the mantle alteration and really find the source of a mineralization. Thank you.